All right. Hello, everyone. How are y'all doing today? I hope everybody's well. Um, I'm going to begin our discussion now on viruses. All right. So up to this point, uh, we have learned about the foundations of the course, the, the ecology, the evolution, um, taxonomy. Uh, so all those are the major themes of Biology 1307. So now we're going to actually get into taxonomic categories of 1307. And we start off with the characteristics of viruses. Right? And viruses are very relevant right now. Uh, we're amidst the, uh, the corona uh, mess, the outbreak, the, this COVID uh, sort of uh, pandemic that we're living in right now. So a lot of relevance that, that you should be able to um, see around us. Uh, based now then on some taxonomical discussion, some ecological discussion, some evolutionary discussion as well. So let's start off looking at what is a virus, right? What actually is the virus? So if, if we shift away from the biology sort of idea of a virus and we go to computers, right? if I were to ask you, what is a computer virus? Is it something that I can hold something they can squash that uh, tear apart right what actually is the virus right the virus is nothing more than a code an instruction uh, usually malicious causing some uh, damage or harm to the uh, to the computer well in the biological setting the virus is the same thing right it's it's a code it's an instruction in the form of nucleic acids so it's either a DNA virus or it's an RNA virus. I'm going to call these RNA viruses retroviruses. So um, it's either an RNA instruction or a DNA instruction that this entity, this virus, injects into a host cell, disrupts the host, and now is kind of uh, generating its own bad influence, its own uh, viral components. So two things, again, a virus is, is made up of two macromolecules, a nucleic acid, the code, the genetic code, uh, and a protective, what we call capsid, a protective shell around the, you know, the virus. So that's all basically, right? So we have a protein shell, protein protection, and some sort of DNA or RNA genetic instruction protected inside. So if you remember from 1306, there's four macromolecule categories. Right? We have nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids, right? So there's the four, but viruses are only going to contain the two. So we're missing our uh, lipids. We're missing our ability to make a phospholipid bilayer. Um, we're missing carbs for short-term energy, for cellular marking. Um, so a lot of things are, are incomplete when we talk about viruses, right? So they're not a complete entity. They're not, they're not considered to be a living organism. And this seems strange, right? How can a non-living thing cause so much complication in your life? Um, this is an abiotic factor, right? So not a living thing, not able to grow, not able to reproduce independently. So these things... We shouldn't even be talking about viruses because they're not living, but because they contain that DNA molecule and because we know about DNA and it's uh, evolutionary sort of idea that uh, DNA is trying to get itself reproduced. So we have a, a genetic material in a non-living system that wants itself to get procreated to another generation. Right? So that is that, uh, that manipulative effect of the DNA molecule. Since we don't have lipids for phospholipids, we don't have a cell membrane, right? So viruses are not cellular. Viruses are not living, right? And, and again, it seems kind of unfair that viruses can cause us so much harm and we technically can't even kill them, right? Viruses are not living. They cannot be killed. Right? Think of a, a rock. I can smash a rock, but, but it's not dead because it never was alive. It never had the life qualities. Um, I can boil water. Uh, but I'm not going to kill water because water has never been alive. Same thing with viruses. Viruses are non-living entities that can very negatively affect human physiology, 
we can't kill them, right? They, they, they are not uh, within the realm of biology. They're abiotic factors, right? So uh, we have this non-living entity made up of protein and DNA that starts to behave as a parasite. Right? It seems kind of strange. How can it, it'd be like me saying a, a rock is parasitic right? or water is parasitic. Air is parasitic to your body, but that doesn't make sense. Well, viruses are non-living and yet they are parasitic. So their goal, this non-living entity's goal is to infect your cells, allow you to become the host and allow then the virus to extract the carb energy that it needs, the lipid energy that it needs, any, um, any other uh, resources it can extract from your body in order to uh, replicate more viral components. Right? So we're talking about a very interesting thing, very interesting level of biology. And technically we're not even biological because we're not alive, right? So if I were to say, uh, let's say uh, chemistry, the realm of chemistry, molecules and atoms and macromolecules, that would be here. And then the realm of biology, life and homeostasis would be here. And that bridge connecting the two now would be then viruses. So viruses are from the chemical world, from chemistry, but they start to develop some sort of quality with the DNA that allows it to reproduce, but it can't do it on its own. So it must find a host, uh, it must infect that host, and it must then take over the living machinery, the living uh, organelles, the living... Uh, sort of uh, cytoplasmic enzymes, everything that it needs in order to replicate more viral components. So again, uh, we have a picture down here that when we talk about most viruses, they picked a really good host when they looked at humans, right? So humans do a lot of things just right for the virus, right? One, we're a social species, right? We, we like to interact in social settings, right? Um, just Think of how difficult it has been for many people to stay home, right? Stay home. If there's a COVID outbreak, stay home. It's, it's not that difficult, but some people, because of their personalities, because of necessity, they, they got to go out and get groceries or whatever the case, um, they go out and, and enhance then the, uh, the chance of that infection being spread from, from host to host. So this is in the sneeze. Uh, I know a lot of individuals have no problem wearing a mask. We understand, well, doctors wear a mask during surgery. That must be important to reduce uh, transmission of uh, viruses and other aspects. A lot of people have no issue. A lot of people do have issue with wearing masks, right? Either because it impedes on their freedom somehow. Um, they're just not comfortable. It's too hot, whatever the case. But understand, uh, a mask would be an important a very, very, you know, important first line defense to prevent something, right? So it's not just the people, um, when you wear a mask, both individuals have a reduced amount of exposure. So let's say a, a person that is positive would then minimize the risk of them uh, releasing the virus. A person that is not yet positive for the virus with a mask would, if it's being used properly, would um, also sort of uh, impede the easy access of the virus into that new host. Right? So again, just be aware, if you, know, if you hang around children, if you know a little bit about children, you know they don't know about hygiene, things like that. Little Johnny sneezes on little Susie. Uh, and, and you know, they just, they're, again, viruses picked a very, very good host. So kids don't wash their hands. Kids are really good at uh, picking up viruses. Um, and then they go home, they share those with the parents, right? And parents go to work and share it with other parents and they go home and they kind of spread it and spread it and spread it. We have then these pandemics that, that develop like, like that. So we know there's spit and saliva and, 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 and mucus that, that goes out when we breathe and sneeze. But now let's think of it as something more. If there's a virus in the system, we're then looking at potentially a uh, viral uh, DNA that's going from host to host to host. Depends on the type of virus, but 
again, it's not um, something that's super difficult to, uh, to pass from host to host, depending on the virus, depending on this mode of infection. Uh, but the idea that, you know, hey, we're a host for this particular entity that we call viruses, and there's many types. Uh, I'm going to pick on some of you here. Uh, some of you that at the first sign of a cough, a sneeze, uh, you all of a sudden become a registered pharmacist and a medical doctor, right? So, <laughs> oh, I think I have this strain of virus. Let me, you know, let me call my buddy, go to Juarez and bring over these antibiotics, right? So all of a sudden, you know which antibiotic to take, you know the proper dosage to take. And again, if you are infected with a virus, we've established that a virus is not alive. Antibiotics are designed to kill things. Right? They're primarily for bacteria or for fungi. Um, viruses are not impacted by the uh, antibiotic. Again, if you don't believe me, go sprinkle your antibiotics on the rocks outside. Right? Nothing's going to happen to the rocks because they're not alive. Right? Antibiotic against life. Viruses are non-living. Right? So just uh, be aware. Be aware. Um, we cannot kill something that's never alive. And, and uh, what we try to do with a lot of the alcohol, the hand sanitizer, all of those are trying to denature the protein. So we can break apart that protein coat, the capsid, uh, then we can uh, hopefully go in there and disrupt the DNA, right? And if we can disrupt the DNA, then the virus no longer has the ability to infect the host DNA and, and, and take over the cell. But again, we got to break through that capsid, that, that protein coat, in order to get into the, the DNA or RNA. So I've used this vocabulary term a little bit, the capsid. The capsid would be here in blue. That's that protein shell, protein covering uh, that would be around the, uh, the DNA or the nucleic acid core. Attached to the capsid in some viruses, not in all, but in some viruses, we would have then these little extensions here that would comprise what we call the envelope, right? So the envelope, uh, these are these oligosaccharide markers on the capsid. And oligosaccharide, well, what are oligosaccharides? Those sound like carbohydrates, right? Saccharides. And we just mentioned that uh, viruses don't have, uh, but two macromolecules, proteins and nucleic acids. So where do they get these carbohydrates? Where do they you know, uh, generate these oligosaccharides from? They don't make them on their own, but they usually steal them from the host. So these markers can be stolen from host cell to identify that cell as belonging to that particular host. So imagine that this virus infects your, your cell, or your, your, your body, your cells, it sees your red blood cells, type O, type A, whatever, type B. So it, it sees your red blood cells. It goes in there and steals some of these A markers or B markers and attaches it to itself. So now when your immune system is scanning in the area looking for foreign invaders, it sees this. It looks, yeah, this looks strange. That I've never seen that blue geometric shape here before, but it seems to have the appropriate markers. So the immune system will not attack that. The immune system will kind of back off and, and, and give the virus free roam of the body or the tissue that it's, that it's trying to infect. So the envelope makes the virus very difficult uh, to recognize as being foreign and therefore very difficult to fight off. Our, our immune system will not fight off something that thinks it should is supposed to be there. So. Viruses that can derive oligosaccharides, that can steal markers from different cells, different organisms, uh, then are able to utilize that organism as a host. Right? So uh, we get into the concept then of a host range. The host range is the variety of cells or species that a virus can infect. So, um, for example, we know COVID, right? Well, COVID. Uh, is right now affecting humans, right? So humans are within the host range for the COVID virus, right? The coronavirus. Uh, different viruses, let's look at rabies, right? The rabies virus 
can affect cats and dogs and skunks and raccoons and foxes and coyotes and, and skunks and, and, and humans, right? Bats, right? So depending on the virus, it's going to specialize on one type of species where that virus may start to uh, affect multiple, 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 multiple organisms, thereby sort of expanding its host range. So the more hosts that a virus can infect, the more dangerous it kind of is because we can get it from multiple areas, right? That's why in the city of El Paso, there's a city ordinance that you must vaccinate your dogs and cats against rabies. It's not that El Paso really cares about your dogs and cats, but El Paso cares that we don't want to get rabies from your dogs and cats, right? So that's this idea of the host range. The wider the host range, the more uh, things that are infected by that virus or can be infected by that virus. Here's a picture of a flu, influenza virus, right? And what do we notice here? This thing has a tremendous number of oligosaccharides, right? A tremendous number of these markers, what we call in the envelope. So all of these masking, hiding, camouflaging the actual capsid uh, and making it very difficult for our immune system to mount a response against that. Right? So if you have the flu, uh, you know, you, you're gonna uh, basically be at the mercy of the flu here, right? So it shall take you to bed, it's gonna have its way with you. It will make you ache, shake and sweat until you moan and groan. Uh, it will make you uh, beg to stop. And then when it's done, it goes and makes life miserable for somebody else, right? So that's the flu. Uh, very similar to many other viruses as well, right? And we get into a very important concept. Let me back up here. We say viruses are parasites. And if we go back to our discussion on parasites, um, parasites are different than predators, right? Predators want to kill the host. They want to kill the host so they can derive nutrition. The parasite is different. The parasite doesn't want to kill the host. It wants to leave the host functional uh, so it can take and take and take and take for as long as possible. Right? So when it's taken all it needs, when it's done with the host, then it, it, you know, it, it leaves or it, it hides or it, it just leaves the host alone at that point. So important concept with this particular virus, the, the COVID outbreak. So we know that many of the people that are dying of COVID uh, are, are already have secondary situations. They're elderly, uh, they have some other uh, immunocompromised uh, condition, They're, they have cancer, they have diabetes, they have other conditions that has already weakened them. So the virus comes in, uh, overwhelms their body, and basically is too much for their system. So very, very few people that are in great health have been wiped out by the, by the COVID virus because it's, it's, it's odd for a virus to, to kill the host. It does happen, uh, but that's not the ecological goal of a virus, right? It wants to take, take, take what it needs and then leave that host so it can go um, to another uh, environment. So here we have different viral structures. Right? We have sort of the artist's rendition up top and an actual micrograph down below. So uh, this was the flu down here, influenza. And you can see that it looks like it has a ring, like this sort of ring around it, right? And this is what we uh, think it looks like. It looks like it has a crown around it, right? And if you speak Spanish, uh, the word for crown is corona. Uh, Corona, right? A corona is this sort of circular aspect. And this is where the coronavirus gets its name, right? Because it has that crown sort of ring structure around its capsid. And again, all of those are oligosaccharides, making it difficult for our immune system to recognize that as foreign. If we compare over here, we have other viruses, simpler, more exposed capsid only a very small amount of an envelope. So this particular virus, the adenovirus, would be much easier for our body to fight off. Here we have a, uh, a virus that is not protected at all with an envelope. 
So this virus, the tobacco mosaic virus, is a plant specialist. If that virus got into our bodies, we would not get sick from the tobacco mosaic virus. We're not a host for that particular virus. It can't uh, hide, it can't break markers off, so our body would see that, attack the capsid, break the capsid, denature the capsid, so it could go in there and disrupt the DNA. Uh, these others are, are interesting. These are what we call bacteriophages. These are bacterial specialists. I don't know if you ever contemplated things, but uh, can, can you envision a situation where a bacteria gets sick from a viral infection? Right? Well, that's what these are, right? These are bacterial specialists. They're going to go in there and attack uh, bacteria and parasitize bacteria, infect bacteria, and bacteria are their only hosts, right? So the idea of a host range, the idea of uh, capsids and envelopes and ecology of, of these different viruses as well. Uh, just an example, very small example of viral diversity. I think you've heard of some of these, right? The flu, uh, you've heard of HIV, right? The human immunodeficiency virus that can lead to AIDS. Uh, the common cold, the herpes viruses, um, tobacco mosaic virus, there's our bacteriophage. Ooh, everybody's heard of Ebola, I think. Like these are a very, very different looking virus. So just a tiny amount of, of you know, diversity. There's, there's a whole taxonomy associated with, uh, with viruses, right? So we look at the different types. These are the taxonomical categories. You may have heard of parvo in your pets, the parvo virus, um, the polio virus, there's the rabies virus, measles, influenza, the retroviruses like the uh, HIV viruses. HIV is a retrovirus, leukemia virus, retroviruses. Um, the herpes viruses are quite interesting. And if we analyze human ecology, uh, Probably the first virus that you acquired uh, was before you were one year old. Right? Uh, if you look at most of the literature today, it says that the first type of virus humans get is the herpes virus. The cold sores on the inside of your mouth is a type of herpes virus, right? The fuego is a little cold source. Um, passed by parents that are sharing utensils, sharing drinks, sharing food, beverages, that kind of stuff. Um, a cousin to that would then be the simplex one, right? So this is not in the inside of the, of the mouth. Now it's on the outside, right? Simplex one. Uh, another variation of simplex one would be simplex two, right? So you can imagine maybe how this sore could work its way farther south on the body, right? Uh, in the genital area. So then we would be talking about genital herpes simplex two. Uh, another cousin of these herpes would be the chicken pox. I don't know if you had the misery of dealing with chicken pox as a kid. Uh, chicken pox virus is a type of herpes. Uh, if you're unfortunate enough to have chicken pox, um, chicken pox never goes away, right? It's not infectious, but you harbor the chicken pox virus. Uh, uh, you say you're strong and you, you don't deal with it, right? Later in life, you get sick. There's too much stress. There's other things bringing your immune system down. Then that chicken pox virus reemerges in the form of the shingles, right? So this very cell is zoster, the shingles. So it's like a, a, a comeback, a much stronger reappearance of the chicken pox virus, right? So again, any of these herpes viruses, you, you, you never get rid of them. Right, so once they are there, you have herpes for the rest of your life. It's not always visible, it's not always infectious, but the DNA is now programmed inside your cells. Uh, another variation then would be the Epstein Barr. You'd probably know that as mononucleosis, the kissing disease, right? So this is a, uh, think of it as chicken pox or herpes of the larynx, right? So the, the throat area. So uh, passed by saliva, and, and again, this is the um, very infectious form of herpes as well. So just showing you some variations of these uh, types of viruses. 
So one thing about viruses, we go back to eco uh, evolution, right? There's always change, right? The virus is always subject, the DNA, the RNA and the virus is always subjected to mutations, always uh, subjected to selection, natural selection. Um, and, and these things, the DNA can mutate. And if it mutates, then that virus can change. It can change its behavior. It can now learn to steal markers from a different host. So the virus, let's say, has adapted, has evolved to affect one type of host. If it mutates and it can then pass to another organism, uh, we talk about now an emerging virus. So that virus has emerged into a new host. Right? It has expanded its host range. And usually this is not good for the new host. Right? And this is in a prime example right now of the coronavirus. Uh, we think the coronavirus came from some sort of bat or something, right? Well, um, bats may have had a lot of uh, years to, uh, to adapt and be selected uh, for uh, you know, strength and resistance to the virus. They built up immunity. Um, and now all of a sudden, this virus jumps into a new host, into humans. We've never seen this current uh, variation of the virus. So our immune cells have no way of recognizing, no way of fighting this thing off. Right? So it had severe pathogenicity. It makes uh, the host very, very sick, right? Pathogenicity, tissue destruction, causing illness. So anytime we have an expansion, that's usually bad for the new host because it has no immune defense against that. Uh, give us a little bit of time. People are surviving. People are building antibodies. Uh, people are learning how to avoid the virus. Give us a, a little bit of time, and the the coronavirus in this current form will be something eh, that nobody's going to be concerned about in, in a few years, right? But it, it, since it's so new, uh, that's what's causing all the chaos right now. Throughout the history, throughout modern history, um, we've seen this situation emerge multiple times, right? So HIV originally started out as a chimpanzee virus, right? It was a, an ape virus, a monkey virus, an ape virus. Um, because of mutation and because we're kind of phylogenetically similar to a chimp, uh, it, it doesn't take too much uh, imagination to see how that virus could have hopped from chimps to humans. Uh, I'm going to post a video uh, that deals with bush meat and sort of a, a the sort of the established way that we think e the Ebola virus and the HIV virus has then hopped down into humans, right? So um, HIV is transmitted through blood and, and fluids, right? So in some parts of rural Africa, they are basically eating um, it's food from the jungle, right? Any, any food that you get from the forest, from the jungle. If I go shoot a deer and eat a deer, I go shoot a quail from the wild and they eat the quail, that's considered bush meat, right? So if that infected ape has the virus, if the meat is not cooked well or in the process of, of, pre of preparation, there's a cut or there's mixing of bodily fluids, um, you can see then how the virus could progress from one host to the human host. So Ebola, again, is an emerging virus that we don't really know where it comes from. Again, the thought is from bats, maybe from rodents. Um, but again, wherever it is in a natural setting, it, uh, the, that organism, that, that original host seems to have some tolerance and immunity to the virus. Once the virus mutates and jumps into the human host, it causes these very pathogenic outbreaks. Uh, the influenza virus. Influenza virus is a bird virus, right? The flu actually started in birds. And you can see, well, how do birds and humans interact? Well, we eat birds, we eat chickens, we eat uh, turkey. Um, we interact with birds in the, in the water. Ducks swim in the water. Humans swim in the water. Um, birds poop in water, that kind of stuff. So it's not a, a very difficult link to see how humans and birds interact, right? Pigeons live all around us as well. So through the evolutionary mechanism of mutation, now we have something that 
has changed and has helped the virus now find new hosts to, to go into, right? And if they go into these new hosts, they have no competition with other viruses, so they have free roam of that, of that uh, system. So again, maybe very odd for us here in the United States, but maybe very typical for other countries, right? So, uh, you know, hey, healthy breakfast of a ape head and some bananas, right? Deer head soup, some sort of crocodile and uh, gorillas, bat head stew, uh, chimps finger licking good, right? That, it seems odd for us to eat, but in our culture, we eat things that are strange maybe to other cultures right so um, but again you can kind of see a mode of potential transmission of infected primates now working their way into uh, human uh, systems there right the virus can jump from a primate uh, relatively easy then to a human so when we talk about Ebola Ebola is a um, it's a very infectious virus uh, right now, we're not hearing a lot of Ebola because there hasn't been a recent outbreak. But um, again, just like with COVID, it, it sparks fear and it sparks confusion, chaos. And that's the idea of then the CDC stepping in, the Center for Disease Control coming in in this protective gear. And this is kind of interesting because the locals don't seem that concerned. This reminds me a lot of this COVID outbreak, right? Uh, some people are very concerned about it, very cautious about it, and other people don't even believe it's real. No, I don't think this is uh, some sort of, I'm very skeptical or, uh, you know, just somebody made this up, this political, this or that. But, but understand the virus is real. Um, you know, the precautions that you take or don't take could have impacts on yourself or um, others ar around you. So just please be aware of that. And I'm going to post a video that, kind of shows the perspective of Ebola from uh, individuals living in an, in an outbreak area. Right? So with Ebola, Ebola is interesting, right? And Ebola, we seem to kind of link to an ecological area around that very hot, humid, tropical uh, environment of Africa. And this to me is a very busy, busy slide here, busy graphs, a lot of information. Uh, but this is what I find interesting. So we see the outbreaks, right? 76, it goes away, and then 79 a little bit. It goes away for a long time. And then we see an emergence in 95, goes away. 2000 lingers for a bit, goes away, comes back in 07, goes 12, goes 14. Um, and basically, that's been the last major outbreak of Ebola. So uh, what happens? Where does it go? How does it reemerge after all these, all these years? And um, if we look at the trends, uh, are we going to see Ebola in, you know, 80, in, in another like 14 years? Or are we going to see Ebola um, soon, right? If, if we follow the more recent path, uh, we're sort of due for an Ebola outbreak sooner rather than later, right? So, so just things that are, that are interesting on how these viruses mutate, change, and how the ecology then uh, has an impact on their spread. So with that, uh, I wanna pause the, the video here. Uh, I wanna watch this part of the lecture, uh, watch the associated e uh, Ebola video, the bushmeat video, and then I'll continue with the viral reproductive cycles afterwards. Yep. So again, we'll call that that first part of the video, and then I'll continue with these in a second slideshow. All right, so be seeing you soon. <laughs> 